Thank you, Dr. Rocky. She's the clicker up there. I'll have to see. So our final speaker of the morning is Dr. Aoife Lyons. She received a bachelor's degree in biology and psychology from the University of Notre Dame, a master's degree in women's studies from University College Dublin, a master's degree and PhD from DePaul University in 2001, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at Northwestern University. She successfully ran her own private practice clinic in Chicago for over 10 years, treating children for, from toddlerhood to university. In 2012, Dr. Lyons returned to Ireland and is currently director of educational engagement for Alltech. She also works in consultation regarding hiring practice, team building, multicultural communication, and intergenerational communication. Dr. Lyons is also an adjunct professor at University College Dublin, Dublin City University, and Trinity, Trinity College Dublin. Please welcome Dr. Lyons. Is there a clicker to advance? Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm just delighted to be here and to have been asked to address you. Um, as was just in terms of the intro, I have a very different background than the background of most of the people in this room. So my talk today is going to be a little bit more broad. Um, I don't know very much about aquaculture. I certainly learned a little bit this morning. So what I'm going to be doing with you this morning is talking about generational differences. So I called this talk initially communication across generations. And I'm not sure if it's come up there yet. Um, I'm seeing it on the screen here. Oh, there we go. Great. So I initially called this communication across generations, but then I decided to change the name of the talk to listening across generations. Because this term, communication, which Jonathan touched on, communication, this is used all the time, and it's really, really important. But communication to me often implies that you're the one doing the talking. And what we know is that the listening part is just as important as the talking part. So today what I'm going to be doing is talking about the different generations that we have, even in this room, how different styles evolve in different generations based on shared experiences that a generation might have, and then hopefully give you guys some useful tools as you go out and you're working with young people or for the younger people in the audience when you're working with older people. So just some little catchphrases here. They have it so much easier than we did. How many people here have found themselves saying that? And I see some young people, I see some older people. I know that I have been guilty of saying this before. You know, with Google, you can just research. You don't have to go to the library. You don't have to do interlibrary loan. You don't have to wait for a book to come in and then pay 10 cents for each copy you're making. So you hear that a lot. They don't get it. They don't get maybe the meaning of work. They don't get the meaning of staying late, putting in the hours. They have no work ethic. These kids today, and they're always on their iPads or they're on their phones, what are they really getting done? Promotion after six months. These millennials, these pesky millennials, you know, they've been with us six months. They really think that they deserve that promotion. Why can't they wait? I waited for five years before I was getting any sort of promotion. This feeling that millennials are out the door at five o'clock, again, with the work ethic. Feedback, how many of the older generation here get frustrated with these millennials and the amount of feedback they want? Constant feedback, how am I doing? Did I do a good job? And we're gonna go a little bit more into why this might be in a few minutes. And maybe for you millennials out there, you get sick of hearing the older generation say these sorts of things. Well, I remember when. So we've got a really unique situation in the American workforce right now, and I'm going to call this the power of four, because we actually have four different generations who are part of the workforce. We have what I'll call the traditionalists, and to me, this would be my grandparents. And about 5% of the workforce is made up of these traditionalists. Then we have the baby boomers, about 38%, and this would be, to me, uh, my parents' generation. Then my generation, which would be Gen X, 32%, 
And right now, the millennials are about 25% of the population. So the baby boomers actually still represent the largest part of the working population. But we have to think about these four generations and how they might see things differently. Jonathan had mentioned per, um, perspective and taking perspective. So take a look at this picture. This is of a little boy with an iPad. And the reason I included this in this presentation is I have a very close friend, and she was telling me a funny story, which was she's got a three and a half year old, or this happened when he was about three, three and a half, and she handed him a magazine to kind of keep him occupied, and then she looked over, and all he was doing was swiping. He didn't realize that he was supposed to turn the pages. And I think that that's just like a really good example of this child will never know what it is not to swipe. Another little example, um, a colleague at work, he would be part of the baby boomer generation, Jeff Frank, this is Jorge, um, he wears reading glasses and he has them on a string, you know, around his neck. And his little grandson said to him, Granddad, why do you have your glasses on a string? And he said, well, Nana says I'm always losing my glasses, so I have them on a string. And being of the baby boomer generation, this colleague still has a landline with a cord in his house. This Gen X and millennials, no, we don't have landlines anymore, but he still has one of these old fashioned phones in his house. And the little boy said to his granddad, are you always losing the phone too? <laughs> because he made the association as a child would between a string and losing something. So again, it's all about perception. If you do a quick Google search on our poor millennials, <laughs> this is what comes up. Millennials are lazy, stupid, the worst. And for the millennials out there, I think you're given a terrible rap. And most of my team consists of millennials um, in my work in Alltech. And I love working with millennials. So I'm going to have lots of positive things to say about you guys again. But if you do the Google search, this is what comes up. So perception, and what I mean by this is that different generations can look at the exact same event and have radically different reactions to it. So for example, Armstrong landing on the moon. I'd like to see a show of hands of people who remember when he landed on the moon. Okay, so there's a good number of people who remember this. So this happened in 1969. Now, I think that's an amazing feat of engineering. Uh, the teamwork that must have had to go into that, amazing. But to me, I cannot remember when we didn't have a man on the moon because this happened before I was born. So to me, I think it's really cool, but it didn't have the same impact when I learned about it than all the people who put their hands up. I'm sure everyone here remembers where they were. But something that would have an impact for my generation would be Princess Diana. I remember being at my grandparents' house in Ireland when she got married. I remember being in graduate school in Chicago when she died. But ask the millennials, this is a pretty picture of a princess. They wouldn't have that, say, personal connection. But they might remember um, Catherine Middleton and her getting married. So it's all a matter of perception. Even when you think about terrorism and 9-11, Millennials wouldn't really remember a time of going through the airport when we have the heightened security that we do now. I remember being a little girl in Lexington, Kentucky with my parents and my dad would travel for business and we could actually go up to the gate to meet him as he came off the plane. I mean, millennials don't remember that that could ever be. You actually went right up to the gate to see your dad come off the plane. So, perception. So right now, we have these four generations, but by 2020, which is only in three years from now, we're going to have five generations in the workforce. So some of the traditionalists, my grandparents' generation, will still be there. The boomers will have shrunk to 22% as they start to retire. My generation will only be 20%. Millennials will be 50% of the population. There are fewer of my generation than there are of the millennials. But then the kids who are in high school now will be entering the workforce too. So it's really important that we understand what shapes people's experiences in different generations and how to work with them differently and how to understand them. Because this does impact leadership. 
Millennials and my team, they expect something very different from me as a leader than maybe previous generations. They expect a lot of collaboration. They expect a lot of listening. They expect a lot of ideas going back and forth. They don't want to be told what to do. They want it to be a joint effort. Feedback is very different. No one on my team of 14 would put up with getting an annual review, nor do I want to do that with them. We do a lot of mentoring on the fly, feedback on the fly, whether it's positive or negative. You know, the millennials get this bad rap for their work ethic not being maybe what the previous generations was. And I don't believe that at all, because I find that there's so much more of a crossover between work and life and enjoyment and fun for this millennial generation. So I have no doubt that if my team is leaving at five, I know I can still count on them to answer emails at 10. And millennials are also very interested in furthering their education. I have a slide a little bit later on saying that they um, would prefer to work for an ethical company, a sustainable company, um, rather than perhaps a bigger paycheck. But they're really interested in training, ongoing training in their jobs. So I've got good news for the millennials. So the boomers are going to be retiring, as I showed you in that slide about uh, 2020, and their jobs are going to be open. There are fewer of my generation to fill the gap. So it's the millennials who will actually have the opportunity, potentially, to progress more quickly in their careers. So I'm going to just briefly go over some shared experiences a whole generation might have and how this shared experience would affect their worldview um, and also their work. So for example, my grandparents' generation would have suffered through the Great Depression and money would have been short. And the idea most likely would have been you would do any job, it didn't matter how menial the job, you would work hard and in that generation would be instilled uh, a great respect for work and a great respect for money. They experienced World War II. And if you have a whole generation of young men going off to war and having to play by the rules in order to keep the country safe and themselves safe, that would instill in that whole generation the importance of playing by the rules, of doing things just so, the way that they're supposed to be doing. And because of World War II, we had an influx of women into the workforce because the jobs were there. There were engineering jobs, there were mechanical jobs, jobs that perhaps it was thought that women couldn't do before, women had to do. And what ended up happening is when the boys came home, the women wanted to keep their jobs. They liked their jobs. Just quickly about the baby boomer generation, they went through the civil rights movement, which would have led to a more team orientation, banding together, for the common good or a bigger cause. They went through the sexual revolution, which was largely fueled by the invention of the birth control pill, which gave women much more freedom over when they were gonna have a baby, when they weren't gonna have a baby, when they were gonna get married, when they were gonna enter the workforce, leave the workforce. But that also led to perhaps seeing sex as more for personal gratification as perhaps procreation. This was the rock and roll era. And rock and roll, obviously, just like the civil rights movement, would have led to involvement and community involvement. This is the generation who got to see the first man on the moon. So the idea that the possibilities are endless, that science and engineering can do anything. So it's also a generation, unlike their parents, who had to scrimp and save and went through the Great Depression, um, there was much more abundance for the baby boomers and they could spend, which often led to overspending. So then my generation, there was an increase in the divorce rate of my generation's parents, which actually led to early independence for Gen X. Gen X tends to be pretty independent. We had MTV. I remember seeing my first Madonna video on MTV. We weren't allowed to have cable, but this was at a friend's house. It was thrilling. 
But we also um, were the generation that were exposed to the AIDS epidemic when it began in the 1980s. So while the boomers maybe had this sexual revolution with the birth control pill, my generation tends to be much more pragmatic when it comes to things like this and much more realistic. So now we're going to get to our pesky millennials. So I'm sorry I'm picking on you guys so much. But maybe if the older generation understands a little bit more about how you tick, they'll be able to work with you maybe a little bit more effectively. So this is a generation that has been ex exposed to school shootings, to acts of terrorism. Because of the internet and because of, of the media, we know about these acts of terrorism happening half a world away or across the country. And this has led for this generation, that and social media, little sense of what is private. The, the lines have been blurred between what is something that's private and what is something that's personal. Social media can lead to a good deal of exhibitionism. And, you know, we can all be whatever we want to be when we're on Facebook. You know, everyone has just taken a fabulous vacation with a fabulous boyfriend and has a fabulous job. And there was a study I read recently, and it said that looking at Facebook actually makes people, and this was the word they used, sad. Because it's this constant comparison towards what your friends are, are achieving or, or where they are in their lives. Participation ribbons. So when I was in graduate school, um, my specialty is in, in children, and we were taught to praise these kids for anything. Like, good sitting on the rug, Johnny. Good holding your pencil. Like things that other generations, you just take for granted. You don't have to praise a child for sitting nicely. Um, but this is a generation who are used to getting a lot of praise, um, a lot of recognition. Um, and this can lead, sorry millennials, to my generation and the older generation thinking that you're entitled. You probably hear that. Does anyone here know what a helicopter parent is? See some hands, okay. So this is a parent who micromanages every aspect of their child's life. So, you know, when I was growing up, there was no such thing as a play date. You just went outside and you played. Um, but organizing music lessons and, um, and sports camps and monitoring the homework and knowing where your child is at every single moment of the day. And a lot of this also has to do with mobile phones. So your kid has a phone, you know exactly where they are at every moment. So almost this over-involvement with a child's life and constantly giving the child feedback. Now something that I caution parents about is if you are so micromanaging your child's life and you want everything to be so perfect, and you never let them make a mistake, you're actually doing them as a disservice because they will not understand how to accept adversity or failure. And the job of childhood is to learn to manage your emotions and you are gonna have some failures. So let your child make some mistakes. Um, so the hovering parents, then when these young people get into the workplace, sometimes they're expecting that of employers as well. But on the positive end of things, this is a generation that is very into the environment, very into sustainability, very into volunteering their time, uh, much more interested in working for a company that has good ethical and sustainable and environmental values. And of course, this is a generation that's always had internet access. I'm old enough that I remember not having, having internet access, and I remember having my first email address when I was probably 20 or so. Um, and I'm sure for other people in this room, they didn't have an email address until much later. But this, this generation, they are used to instant gratification. And when they get into the workforce, that can sometimes become a problem for them. The young people that I work with, we run one program, a lot of programs, but one program in Alltech called the Career Development Program. And this is for young people who've just finished university or their master's within 18 months. And we take 12 of them every year. And to put it in perspective in terms of the competitiveness of this program, there were 4,000 applicants from 70 some countries this year for this particular program. And I was giving them a lecture on Saturday and I almost wish that I had included this slide um, because it's talking about they want everything and they want it now and it's this instant gratification. But the slide just says, patience is also a form of action. So if you decide consciously to be patient, then you do feel like you're doing something. So the Great Recession is also a shared experience, which could lead to a lot of entrepreneurial startup sorts of, of ventures for young people. 
So I just wanted to say a word about sustainability in young people. The name of this talk was Listening Across Generations, Implications for Sustainability. And what I meant by sustainability is the sustainability of the workforce and how we can engage with young people. As I was talking with Kathleen about a year and a half ago, uh, she had seen me give a similar talk and thought that you guys might find this interesting. And then when I was talking with Jeff about two weeks ago, he said that one of the biggest issues that, that your group is facing is how to engage with young people, retain young people, have um, young people take up all the funding that you're talking about and the educational programs, um, and how to spark the interest and keep the interest of young people. What I will say about this generation and their commitment to the environment is that it's ingrained in, in them. Jeff was, was telling me how he remembers when recycling started and it was a new thing and he's committed to recycling, but for his kids, it's just a given. So I would say in our current political climate, which I won't say too much about, um, with people saying that there's no climate change, <laughs> um, it's up to the young people to stick by their guns and what they really believe in and push forward um, the environmental agenda. So just briefly, who here has kids maybe between the ages of five and 15? Okay, so they're, they're what we're calling, some people are calling the Z generation, the I generation for iPod, but they actually are swinging backwards from where the millennials were. Okay, these are kids who are digital natives. They've never known what it is not to have a cell phone in their hands. But they have seen what their older brothers and sisters have done with social media. And they're actually much more conservative about their accounts. Things like Snapchat that just go away instantaneously. I'm very careful about who they have a picture taken with. And I can tell you millennials, if you're applying for jobs and things like this, please know that you will be thoroughly Googled. And this past year, I'm describing this program with the 12 young people. There were two excellent young people who we were about to take, and I did not take them because of what I found on social media. So your employers will look. But these kids, the teenagers now, are much more savvy about this. Because they're a product of my generation, they tend to be quite into safety, and again, more like the traditionalists. So I just thought this was absolutely true, that every generation does have its doubts about the younger generation. So where do we have conflict? And think about in your own lives and the, in the teams that you have, do you have conflict with millennials? Do you have conflict with older people? There's sometimes a conflict over the perceived work ethic, and I say perceived work ethic because we all work in different ways. And if millennials are into multitasking and traditionalists are into sitting in your corner office um, until six o'clock in the evening, that's a perceived difference in work ethic. View of authority, millennials tend to be much more familiar, say, with their bosses than maybe traditionalists would be. The definition of what a good leader is is very different for the younger generation who, again, want this collaboration, don't necessarily want to be told what to do. Here's a little trick about <laughs> um, helping, I think, millennials have a sense of empowerment and a sense of ownership. What I often do with my team is ask a young person to come up with two or three solutions to whatever the challenge is. I know that the two or three solutions are fine with me, so I give them the opportunity to choose for themselves to help in terms of empowerment and to take ownership of a project. But you could use that trick with your kids too. You know, what's for dinner? <laughs> Give them two options and they get to pick. And communication. This is a huge area of potential conflict. I have an uncle who never understands why I don't just pick up the phone and call him. Well, I don't pick up the phone and I always have my phone on silence. I text people. So we all have different styles of communication. Um, different generations have different styles. So the traditionalists maybe want a letter. My parents' generation want a phone call. I don't want a phone call. Please don't call me, just text me. Um, my generation um, perhaps using email and then the younger generation using text. So, The question is, you know, we're talking about communication, or we really should be talking about having a conversation and sitting down face to face in this world of emails and texts. It's really, it's wonderful that you're having this meeting where you can see people that you've known for years, but you're seeing them face to face. And that degree of human interaction really does make the difference in terms of communication. And I think this is, might be 
typical of this younger generation. Hi, sweetie, how was school today? You can read all about it on my blog, Dad. So the poor dad, all he wants is that face-to-face -face human interaction with his little girl. And she's probably, he's thinking, why is she running into her computer again? And she's thinking, well, this is part of my homework to blog, so just check it out there. So in terms of feedback, for the traditionalists, my grandparents, no news is good news. So if I haven't told you anything, if I'm not yelling at you, it's fine. This was a generation of how can I help you, how can I help my neighbor? This generation thinks that flexibility means that you're just wasting time. And again, if you're not hearing anything, if you're not being shouted at, you're fine. The boomer generation, we're a generation of hard workers, a um, generation that works hard and plays hard, but also believe that they worked an awfully long time to get that corner office or to get that title, and believe that younger people need to go through the same channels as well. Maybe a little bit less likely um, to want to have change. If th something is working in the right way, why would you go in and change it? My generation, Again, with the independence, we think that we can manage our own careers, although we do want to be upskilled. And millennials, they do want a lot of feedback. And in my opinion, and in my experience, when I start to work with a new millennial, maybe one of the, the 12 that we have who just started, they require a lot of time, a lot of time. But I find that if I put the time in on the front end, it really just pays back astronomically on the other end, and they become much more independent. But I find that there's this weaning process with the feedback. But they're also polite. Think of the millennials you know. They're really very polite, and I do get a lot of, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I know you're in the middle of something, but can you tell me how I'm doing? Was that okay? Was that okay? Was that okay? Um, because of the speed of the internet and how quickly they can get information, they get very frustrated. Um, and impatient when things don't go fast. So again, patience is also a form of action. And this is a generation that does look out for themselves. How can you help me? So I thought that um, just in the ending of this presentation, I would add in a little bit about psychology. And in psychology, we have what's called a cognitive reframe. And this is when, just at the beginning, when I was showing you those pictures of the man on the moon and Princess Diana and Kate Middleton and 9-11, we can all look at something, it can be the same thing, and we can have a different perception of it. And so what I would ask you to do when you're thinking about millennials is to think about the characteristics that they have, what we think, but how we could reframe that because they are gonna be 50% of the population very, very quickly. They expect to have more than, well, two to five employers in their lifetime. They would much more prefer to communicate electronically. They're looking for work-life balance. And scarily enough, in 2025, they're gonna be 75% of the population. And they won't be millennials anymore, maybe they'll have a different name. Um, I saw a funny article in the New York Times recently, and it was talking about millennials managing millennials. So there's all the complaints that people have about managing millennia, millennials, um, but what happens when they're managing themselves, they have the same complaints that these guys are goofing off and why are they on social media all the time and what's the work ethic here? So I just thought that was kind of funny. So a cognitive reframe, the perception that this is the me, me, me generation. So these kids are entitled. Or the reframe could be, well, what's wrong with them having high expectations and setting high goals for themselves and setting high goals for a company or a university? So you can see it in two ways, the same behavior entitled or actually just setting high expectations for themselves. We might say that they're lazy or maybe they're just really flexible and they're multitasking all the time, which in my experience they are. They're doing two or three or four or five things all at once on different devices. <laughs> the perception might be that they have a lack of respect for authority that they don't look up to the leaders with the same respect that maybe one of us would have given to. And um, the reframe could be, you know, this is a generation that has been brought up to question authority, to ask the whys, not just to accept the status quo, to think for themselves. 
Reception could be that they have a poor work ethic. But as I showed on a slide a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago, they really do want this work-life balance. And that's really more important to them than their salaries in many cases. No loyalty. This is a generation that's just going to jump ship, right? No loyalty to a company. But maybe they're just realistic, you know? Um, there was a young man who was working for us, I live over in Ireland, working for us for about three years, and invested lots of, lots of time in him, very much millennial. As I was putting together these slides, I was thinking of him, because he could be seen as lazy, but he actually always did get his work done. He could be seen as entitled, but he was very, very polite. Um, but he jumped ship, and after we invested three years in, in him, he's working for Facebook. And actually, I couldn't be more pleased for him because it's a much better fit. But when I did this slide, I thought, he's realistic. He knows what he could do at Alltech, but he knows what the opportunities would be at Facebook, which is better for him. So what do these millennials actually want? And how can you give this to them? They want open communication, which means transparency. If you don't know, my experience, if you don't know the answer with a millennial, Tell them that you don't know or that you're working on it or a decision hasn't been made. They really want to see their leaders in action. So they don't want to see the leader in the ivory tower telling all the people what to do. They want to see their leader being as involved in an activity as they are, whether it's a volunteer activity or whether it's a work activity. They want to have that access to their leaders. And they like working for progressive companies who champion social causes, environmental causes. And I think that we all, we're all aware of that. So in closing, some tips about communication across generations, no matter whether you're dealing with a traditionalist or a boomer or someone like myself or someone younger, some tips for communication in general. Know who you're talking to and don't make assumptions. Just because you think someone looks like they could be a boomer, they might have a millennial mentality. But know who you're talking to. And the way you know who you're talking to is by making a personal connection and spending the time as much as you can one-on-one -on -one with the human interaction. I always say to people, discuss expectations right away because at the beginning of a relationship, whether it's a work relationship, um, professional relationship, or even an interpersonal relationship, this is the only time that you can set what your expectations, your boundaries, your limitations might be. So be clear about that, especially when it comes to communication. You know, to ask someone, do you prefer to be text? Do you prefer to be called? Is an email okay? But ask what people's preferences are right away. Everyone likes to get positive feedback. Um, the millennials do expect more of it. So if you are of the older generation and you don't feel that you want to be giving all this constant feedback, tell them. You're not going to get that kind of constant feedback. You're going to get a monthly feedback or whatever it might be so that they know and that they don't keep bugging you about it. <laughs> um, ask for communication about feedback on your communication because you might think that you are an excellent communicator and that you've said your piece and you didn't at all. Something I have to watch about myself is that I sugarcoat things and I try to make things all very nice, nicely packaged, and sometimes then people don't get exactly what I mean. So ask for feedback. Ask someone, what did you just hear that I said or what did you understand about what I just said? And mentoring can go both ways. We think traditionally of older people mentoring younger people, but the reverse mentoring works really, really well as well, especially when it comes to th things like the informatics and, um, and those sorts of te technology things. So mentoring both ways is important. So in closing, have the conversation with your colleagues and listen, and something that's interesting about listening is when someone is being listened to, there's a spike in serotonin in the brain, and serotonin is the neurotransmitter that's involved in happiness. Because listening shows that you're curious about other people, and curiosity is as important as intelligence. So that's the end of my presentation, but I'm going to give a quick plug here for Altec's Aqua Challenge, which is going to be happening tomorrow. And in Alltech, we run innovation competitions around the world. We do one in Brazil, in Ireland, in Kentucky. Um, and this year, we have been fortunate enough 
that the society has allowed us to run an aqua challenge here. So this is going to be run tomorrow at um, 1.30 in room 16. And we were going to have two challenges for students. So all students are welcome. Professors are welcome to come as well. There are going to be two aqua challenges that will be presented tomorrow at 1.30. Students can be in groups of one to six. They have an hour to go away and come up with their solution to the challenge, and then we'll have short five to 10 minute presentations in the afternoon starting about three or 3.30, and then a final judgment, I think, and the whole thing will end at around five. So I'd encourage any students or professors to go along to that too, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think that I feel a little guilty about how I treat my millennials now. I'm not sure. So I'm going to have to think a little bit about some of those tips you provided and really appreciate that. Given that this generation is increasing to be the largest part of the workforce, I think it really is important for us to accommodate where we can and to understand and communicate. So thank you very much for that. Um, Dr. Lyons will be here for the rest of the afternoon till about two o'clock. So um, you can catch her and, and inquire some more. Jonathan, Dr. Van Senten will be here for the conference. So please touch base with Jonathan. And we heard Dr. Rocky will be leaving shortly after, but she'll have an hour of time that you can inquire about some of these uh, granting opportunities. So. Um, a programming note, we typically hold the student spotlight presentations at this point, but we've moved them this year to room 13 at 11 o'clock. So you'll have some free time for a coffee break and enjoy the trade show. And then if you would join us back in room 13 at 11 o'clock, we'll hear about some of our excellent student presentations. So thank you very much.